Hey everyone, so this video is the first video that switches us um, away from talking about your sense organs and actually starts switching us into talking about perception. Uh, so just very quickly, um, the definition of sensation we have talked about in multiple videos for Unit 3. Sensation is simply your eyes, your ears, your skin, etc. Uh, if they have an environmental energy that they can detect because it reaches a frequency or a level of threshold that your ears are programmed to be able to react to or your eyes are able to react to or your, your taste buds are able to react to, uh, then they simply will activate as described in all the other videos. Um, and then they will simply convert that into neurological data before they leave the sense organ and then head off to the brain. And that is it for sensation. That, that, that is all it is. You know, light waves into the retina and then being transduced into neurological data that the optic nerve will send off to the brain. And that's it. A, a sensation is done. Sensation, there's no thinking involved. Uh, sensation is just a conversion process um, that your sense organs, as soon as they reach a level or a intensity or frequency that they are programmed to care about, they will do so, and then they hand it off to your brain. Uh, so there is no thinking involved with sensation. It's just a blind uh, conversion process into neurological data that then your brain has to make sense out of. And so once it reaches your brain, then becomes the very, very complex process of perception. So when it comes to sensation, barring something such as you being colorblind or blind or uh, barring something such as you being deaf or extremely hard of hearing, um, there are people that actually can't, for example, smell, uh, and not just temporarily like a symptom of COVID, uh, but actually there are people that cannot smell. It's actually not as uncommon as you might think. Barring anything such as that, sensation is done and all of our sense organs work exactly the same, barring those exceptions that I gave examples of. So the differences in our brains rely on perception. You know, two different people can look at the same dress that went viral and some people are like, oh, no, that's definitely a white gold dress. And other people are like, what are you talking about? That's definitely a blue black dress. Many, you know, everyone can listen to the same audio file and they can, you know, half the, about half the population here is Yanny, about half of the population here is Laurel. You know, you have people that are looking at dual sided images like the old woman, young woman or the two faces in the cup. And some people are seeing the faces, some people are seeing the cup, some people see the old woman first, some people see the young woman first. Uh, well, the, the differences lie in perception. So perception, if sensation is just the act of getting data from the environment to your brain, the simplest example of perception is how your brain makes sense out of or how your brain chooses to interpret that information. So all of us heard the same soundtrack uh, all of us looked at the same viral dress video. All of us looked at the same old woman, young woman, um, optical dual-sided image. But yet we all tend to then, then fall onto a different side. And some people agree with us and some people disagree with us. And this obviously becomes much more complex when you are, for example, looking at a viral video that was shot on somebody's cell phone and then it is uploaded to YouTube or and it goes viral and then people watch the same you know, interaction, um, whether it be something simple or silly or something obviously very uh, socially moving, uh, such as you know body cam footage or some kind of pedestrian footage of some kind of event. And then everybody has their opinion on how should you feel about this and how we should react to it. And some people say, you know, that is justified. Some people say that is, um, that is unjustified. Well, this all comes down to perception. And so perception, your individual perception, perception determines reality. And so even though, you know, there is one reality in the sense that the environment is only giving us, you know, one, uh, one version of events, like the, the reality around us is giving us one version of events in terms of our sense organs. But in terms of reality from a perceptual difference, there is, what, 8 billion people on the planet? 
there are 8 billion different definitions of reality. Most of the time we may agree with each other. There may be differences here and there. But there are a multitude of differences of the interpretation of reality. Even though we all look at the same information, we all soak in the same information, uh, and yet our brains then change it to be interpreted based on our perceptions. Now, why are there so many different perceptions? Unlike sensation, which is just bringing it in, Perception is built to be interpreted non-neutral. Like you are not neutral to anything, pretty much. There is nothing really left in the world for you to be neutral to. And I don't mean that you are, like when I say that you are biased, I am not implying a negative connotation this time to bias. We'll talk about negative biases later. But bias, I just mean in this case, is that you do have a slanted opinion of reality and how you choose to interpret it. Because your perception is built off of your previous experiences, your previous encounters, your previous memories, your previous emotional states, your previous interactions with other people. That is what is built out of your perception. So essentially, every time your eyes or your ears or your skin or your nose, etc., bring information to your brain your brain immediately starts to reference to all of the memories, all of the files, all of your previous information that you have in your brain that you have lived with for, you know, years upon years. And that is what that gets involved in this process. You know, your brain is not an unbiased, impartial juror when it comes to information coming in because you have had experiences and memories and previous events and therefore it is impossible for your brain not to go ahead and automatically uh, match it with existing data you have now this would make sense because obviously from a survival standpoint your brain would want to immediately match any incoming data with previous memories and experiences as a reference to do i have any previous encounters with this Have I had this in my life before? Have I encountered this before? How should I feel about it this time based on my last and previous experiences? So whether, you know, when you get into arguments with people over highly, um, you know, fueled opinions and events, when you, when you, you know, get into debates and heated discussions with people over uh, big events in society about like, you know, social, uh, social issues and controversial subjects and, and things like that that are very difficult you may disagree with them, but chances are the reason why this is happening for all of you is, yes, you've read the same documents, you've seen the same videos, but the perceptions are very different. So let me just show you one uh, simple example of the difference between sensation and perception. Uh, Let me pull this up here real quick. Um, But one example is something as simple as, um, one example is as simple as what is called the Necker Cube. Uh, This is a very famous optical illusion. I could actually probably teach almost this entire unit using this one optical illusion. Obviously, I would never do that. Uh, But this is called the Necker Cube. Now, sensation was simply putting black and white regions from, you know, the frequencies of light into your eye. Your eye sent it to your brain in the form of areas of black and white light. And then now your brain's going to run with that. So sensation was just getting the black and white into your brain. Now your brain is going to start matching it with, is there anything I can connect this or relate this to? And for most of you, you probably didn't see a box or a cube. Well, first of all, there is no box or cube, in part because this is a two-dimensional image. Also, there is uh, clearly a large amount of areas that are not filled in. But one thing about your brain, your brain is sometimes nothing more than an anticipation machine, and your brain instantly uh, has a process of, I am going to interpret information to best fit what I already know with the information I have been given. Uh, Your brain is a good example of being that really annoying friend that halfway through the movie already tells you who they think the killer is or who what they think the plot twist will be and then starts to explain why 
even if they may or may not be proven right, they're going ahead and jumping to the end, even though we are not there. Well, that is exactly what is happening with this Necker Cube, and we'll talk about that in other videos, but your brain is like, I've been given enough. I know where this is headed. I don't need to see all of it. I don't need to see any more. I know how this is, this is going to roll out. Obviously, this box, because this is a still image, it's never going to technically be a box. It's never going to transform into a three-dimensional cube. However, your brain can see where this is headed. Well, that was not the job of sensation. That's the job of perception. Now, in the case of this one, the reason why most people, and again, you'd be surprised, a lot of people actually don't see this as a box or a cube, especially younger uh, children might not see it this way. But most people, the reason why we, most of us tend to go into the same boat of like, yeah, I see a box there, is simply because we have all had previous memories of what three-dimensional boxes obviously look like. We know what cubes look like, and our brain's like, okay, most of that's there. I see where this is headed, and I'm going to go ahead and finish that off, and that is perception. Now, we'll talk about this later, hopefully in a different video. I will bring this up again. Technically, as I pointed out, there is no cube here, but actually, not only can you argue there is a cube here, you can actually argue that there are two cubes here, but that is a conversation hopefully for a different uh, video. Uh, so make sure you understand that what gets us into disagreements with each other, you know, we all watch the same body cam footage from, you know, or we all watch the same CCTV footage, or we all listen to the same speech from a celebrity or a politician, and we immediately have a wide array of reactions, even though we all heard the same thing, we all saw the same thing, that's not sensation's issue. That's a perceptual difference. And perception is built on the, uh, our opinions of formed memories and experiences and past events. And again, I don't mean it in a negative way, but our brains are biased to interpret information in ways that best fit what we have experienced before and also best fits our previous learned memories to the best of our ability. That is perceptual. Now, uh, another confusing pair um, is what is called bottom-up processing and top-down processing. Now, bottom-up processing means analysis and interpretation begins with the factual environmental data that we use as a jumping-off point as opposed to top-down processing, which uses our previous information and experiences, and that is the jumping-off point that our brain uses. So let me show you a different image. Um, this image right here is a good example of bottom-up versus top-down. So in this picture... Let's say we got rid of uh, the A, the C, the 12, and the 14. Let's say that all of those were gone, and you happen to see a card that had this one piece on it. Well, bottom-up processing is simply sending you two black lines. Bottom-up processing would be you interpret that as a straight line and a noticeably double curved line. That would be bottom up because that is technically what is there is a is a straight black line and a, a double curved uh, black line and that is what is being sent to your brain. So if you were to see it that way, that would be bottom up processing because that is the information that is being given. There's nothing more there than that. However, top down processing. Even if I were to leave, let's say we leave the A, the C, the 12, the 14, let's say we leave that away, if you as a top-down processing event look at that, and you're like, okay, I see that, oh wait, that's a 13, or oh wait, that's a B, you immediately just did top-down processing because you took two lines, okay, you took two ambiguous lines, and you immediately turned it into something you can relate to. Some people chose 13, some people chose B. It doesn't matter. Again, that shows you the perceptual difference, but the fact that your brain interpreted it into something that technically is not, that is the top-down processing. Now, to take the top-down processing to a whole new level, depending on if you choose to look at the horizontal or the vertical, that can actually make it keep changing back and forth. Sometimes you see it as a B, sometimes you see it as a 13. It really depends on which way you're choosing to look at it. You're getting new perspectives of it both times, and so now it has changed. So the bottom up was just the lines, the top down is which of the two you see it as, and that can even change as you go. 
Now, uh, bottom up. Bottom up tends to happen, especially in instances where you have little to no experience. So if you see some kind of new cultural event or new some kind of like someone shows you a video of something and you have no reference for it, you've never seen anything like this before, you've never heard of anything like this before, it is like, oh my goodness, I've, I've never even note, like I've never even heard of such a thing. And, it, and you're just soaking it in as environmental information to just kind of like keep for later. That is bottom up processing. As you can imagine, children do tons and tons of bottom-up processing because often so many new experiences to babies and toddlers are new to them. As a result, they are constantly having to process what is. That is why for a small child, they may not see this as a cube because they are not capable of top-down processing it yet because they don't have the information and they're like, oh, it's this. Uh, oh, it's just lines, or it's just colors, or it's just black and white. Well, that's the bottom-up processing. However, top-down processing is when you start to see it as things that you have interpreted based not on what is there, but based on the evidence that you have stored previously in your brain. So a simple example of top-down processing is when you can successfully walk around your house in the middle of the night when it is pitch black you are actually not even getting any data from the environment. So you're not even capable at that moment of bottom-up processing. But it doesn't matter, because you already have a previously stored layout memory of the schematics of your surroundings in your house. And so, top-down processing, your brain is relying on what it already knew, what it already had interpreted and perceived, and as a result, you should have little to no difficulty. Now, if you were in an environment that like you are not familiar with, like you're staying someplace like summer camp or a friend's house that you had hardly ever been in before, good luck navigating in pitch black because you don't have access to a lot of top-down information. And as a result, you need the bottom-up to help form new ideas that you really haven't been able to transmit yet. Another good example of the bottom-up and the top-down is uh, a lot of the color illusions do this. Um, so, for example, if you look at this image here, um, these gray bars, like what you should be getting in your brain is some gray bars and some black bars and some white bars. However, if, you, if your brain was only doing bottom-up processing, these gray bars and these gray bars are actually the exact same color. But I doubt you see them that way. Okay? Most of you, you should see that these gray bars are darker. These gray bars are lighter. That's actually not true. They're actually the same color. So if, you, if your brain was doing bottom-up processing, if it was going solely on the actual evidence being provided by your eyes, then these two should fundamentally look exactly the same. But your brain is doing top-down processing because one thing about colors, especially, colors are what color they are, not just because of the frequency they give, but also by the surrounding colors. So a bright yellow shirt won't just be yellow when it's around other colors. It's really going to pop if it's surrounded by everyone else wearing black shirts. It's going to seem even more yellow. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. So the black bar is making this gray lighter, and the white bars are making these uh, gray bars darker because of contrast, and it's just, it's, it's a discrepancy that your brain uses all the time. It's not supposed to be like that, but your brain can't help itself. So if your brain was doing bottom up, it'd be the same, but your brain can't help itself, and it's making them look different. Now it's doing top down. It's not going with the evidence that's there. It's going with the evidence it thinks it's supposed to be. And as a result, that is the issue. So what happens is you can imagine that the analogy is if your brain is using bottom up, it is like a jury member who is solely deciding innocent or sorry, guilty or not guilty based solely on the actual factual evidence that is being submitted to the court by both the prosecution and the defense. That would be bottom-up. I'm only relying solely on the evidence. However, top-down, which unfortunately some jurors tend to do, 
top-down processing, jurors may often be swayed by their experiences, by their emotion, by what the defendant looks like, how the defendant acts, how the defendant dresses, how the prosecution words their opening and closing statements, how the defense words their opening and closing statements, that is top-down processing. You're not necessarily being guided by the evidence. You're being guided by other, what we would think of as irrelevant information. So that is the difference between the two. Uh, again, uh, make sure you don't uh, get them mixed up with each other. Um, as I pointed out multiple times over several videos, sensation and perception obviously work together. Like, your brain is constantly sending new data to your brain nonstop. Your eyes are open, your ears are listening, your tongue is working, your skin is working. It, your brain is constantly getting sensation, and your brain is having to constantly do perception. Most of the time, we agree on each other. Um, one of the uh, phrases I saw from one of my favorite psychologists in one of his TED Talks, he said, you know, um, reality is just usually an agreed upon hallucination. So what that means is most of the time when you and I and everyone else, you know, see stuff, hear stuff, taste stuff, whatever, 99.9% .9 of the time, we all agree. Most of the time, our perceptions agree. However, every once in a while, you get a glitch in the matrix, such as that dress, and then that shows that there are perceptual differences. Most of the time, we all agree on how to interpret information. But every once in a while, you'll see the perceptual differences, whether it be a controversial footage of, a, of an event, whether it's a debate over a hot-button issue, or something as simple as Yanny versus Laurel. And then, obviously, our brain is constantly comparing bottom-up and top-down processing, and which way your brain chooses to interpret information has a lot to do with which information is being provided. Uh, then, that brings me to the last two parts of this video. Uh, oh, by the way, I do believe in the description below there is an excellent video that does a good comparison and contrast between bottom-up and top-down processing and gives you a few examples. I highly recommend you check that out if you feel like you need more help with that. Uh, there is also in the description below uh, of this video a couple of really awesome videos of synesthesia. Um, synesthesia um, affects about 1% of the population, so it's not as rare as people might think. Uh, synesthesia is a harmless but interesting neurological condition where people have what is called sense blending. So synesthesia, you know, even though, you know, when you see the world, you know, you know that obviously you're seeing it, you're hearing it, you're tasting it, you're smelling it, etc. However, normally for most people, even though they're all going to your brain, you know, team smell is team smell, and team vision is team vision, and team hearing is team hearing, and they don't interact with each other except for completing an idea. But not for people that have synesthesia. So synesthetes, which again, about 1% of the population, they have a rare neurological, it's probably somewhat inheritable, because it tends to run through family trees, uh, synesthesia is where there is a sense blending where multiple senses of theirs are normal, but also overlap with each other in ways that most people, their senses do not overlap. So one of the best examples of synesthesia is color letter. There's also color number. I've read articles about a guy who had shape taste. You can have taste color, sound taste, sound color. There are more than 25 types of synesthesia. And most people that have synesthesia actually have more than one of these. And I have had multiple students. I've had about six students who have had a synesthesia that I knew of. And probably there were at least another five or ten I've had over the years that either had it, um, have it, and chose not to talk about it, or... Um, Maybe in some cases, many synesthetes actually don't even know until they're older that they even have synesthesia because they actually think that everybody actually um, sees the world that way or hears the world that way. So they didn't know that there isn't anything necessarily different about them. So what happens with synesthetes, for example, is if they have color letter synesthesia, they will, for example, you could show them a uh, an alphabet. And you could show them a black lettered alphabet and they would know and they would see the alphabet letters as uh, black, but there would also be a color hue overlapping their field of vision, similar to a hallucination. 
uh, and they would know that there is a colorful hue overlapping it that they also would see, so suddenly the letter A could be red, or B could be blue, or C could be green, and then the words could be that way. Um, there's color number. Uh, another very common one is sound color. Many people that he, uh, many synesthetes that have uh, that hear, they hear normally, but they also often have fields of color that kind of semi-transparently um, um, appear during the process of hearing voices uh, and also hearing sounds such as music or inanimate sounds. And so there's many, 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 many types of synesthesia. And like I said, I've had multiple students. Uh, who've had synesthesia. I'm going to use one, just I'm going to use one former student as an example. So in her particular case, she had a, a, a large number of synesthesias. Her mom also had synesthesia, not as many. Uh, but in her particular case, uh, she had uh, color letter and color number. She also had color sound. She also had uh, what I would think of as person texture or personality texture. Um, and so in her particular case, uh, for example, uh, words and color, sorry, words had colors and numbers and uh, letters had colors. Also, any kind of sounds would produce colors as well. And people's personalities or people's, um, um, people's um, a presence would actually cause feelings of texture, like, like items and people to her had textural ideas so for example in the case of me because we got uh we actually became pretty close friends and talk uh, uh, and keep in touch even after uh, she has graduated uh but in in my particular case my voice to her is like a burgundy color it's like a wineish burgundy color that is the color of my voice uh to her and then also uh for whatever reason um, t either talking to me or if you were to see a photo of me or to, you know, have a conversation with me or think about me, uh, that would cause for her, for some reason, to have feelings of, um, like stained glass, like the texture of stained glass. Now, there's no rhyme or reason. I want to point out, there, like, first of all, synesthetes cannot turn this off. Like they, hopefully they, it's a good experience because they, uh, because they, they can't turn it off. And also they do not get to pick or choose uh, what it is. Like my voice color will always be burgundy to her. She can't switch that. And there's nothing I can do either. I will point out one time my voice was not burgundy to her. And she asked me, she's like, are you feeling okay? I was like, yeah, why? She's like, well, your voice is like a rusty orange and that's not normal for you. She's like, I just wondered if maybe you were sick. I'm like, oh no, no, I feel fine. By the end of the day, I had a cold. And so she knew I had, a, she was getting, I was getting sick before I did, uh, but she, she, it has nothing to do with me. Like my, 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 if like she said that, you know, like, you know, your personality is like sandpaper. That's not a reflection of you as a person. That's just the match that her color texture, um, personality would have. Uh, but she had no idea there was anything different about her, um, at all. She thought everyone saw the world this way. Uh, for her, she doesn't notice this. This is like second nature. It doesn't bother her. It's just there, like background noise. Um, but she had no idea there was anything even different about her, I believe, until she was like in fourth grade. And then her their teacher, her teacher, I think, made her write an essay about what her favorite number was and why. And so her essay was something along the lines of, my favorite number is three because threes are green and green is my favorite color. And I'm sure her teacher is like, what the heck are you talking about? And it was only then that she started to realize that maybe not everybody had these. I also had a former student that um, for him, um, days of the week and certain other words had emotion feelings, uh, like anthropomorphic feelings, even though they were inanimate. So like, for example, for him, Mondays had like positive, warm feelings, even if it was like, even if you're like, oh, Mondays are terrible. Well, to him, Mondays always had um, an emotionally positive feeling. And for him, I believe Thursdays, Thursdays had like this negative, dark connotation. There's no rhyme or reason to that. Like, like his, some of his best days ever could be a Thursday. But there's still this lingering, uh, this lingering cl a cloud of this. So please check out the video below on this. It's a harmless neurological condition. They like to study synesthetes uh, because of this uh, this weird blending of their senses. Uh, I believe one of the videos in the description below I linked 
is a guy that has color music and color taste. So he actually chooses his food, not just because of taste, but also the color combination it makes. Uh, synesthesia, again, is uh, not that uncommon. Uh, as you might have, uh, imagine, synesthetes tend to work in pretty creative fields. I, uh, one study showed that synesthetes are six times more likely than the general population to work in artistic fields. Um, like the girl, my former student that I was referring to, um, amazingly talented in anything artistic. Um, and um, But uh, a couple famous examples of synesthesia. Um, and you can look it up. You can actually just Google a uh, Google famous um, synesthetes. Um, or famous people with synesthesia. Uh, but Vincent Van Gogh was definitely thought to have synesthesia. It is also highly suspected uh, that William Shakespeare had synesthesia. Uh, if you need a more modern example, um, uh, Billy Joel uh, has synesthesia. And then also, and I can't remember which one, so I don't want to misquote, but you'll definitely notice that there are about five or six modern recording artists slash singer slash uh, instrumental um, uh, musicians that also have synesthesia that you have definitely heard of. Uh, and they don't all have the same ones. But for example, in the, in the situation with Billy Joel, uh, because he has like a color sound and color like rhythm, uh, often a lot of the stuff that he does with his songs and a lot of his uh, songwriting uh, that he used to do and, and on his piano as well, a lot of that was... Um, due to uh, him trying to find color patterns that he enjoyed and also made sense that also happened to produce music. So again, very fascinating. Uh, again, synesthetes, they can't turn it off. It's extremely harmless. It is not really distracting in most cases. Um, but um, yeah, but uh, again, synesthesia, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. And if you yourself, if you're watching this video, and if you have synesthesia, um, uh, of some way, shape, or form, uh, feel free to message me or send me a message, and, and I would obviously, um, you know, keep anything that you tell me uh, completely private. Most people with synesthesia, like, like for example, with her, she, she wasn't, like, ashamed of her synesthesia, because, again, that's nothing to be ashamed of at all. Uh, it's actually interesting and fascinating, but uh, she didn't particularly like to talk about it with too many people, uh, and that, it wasn't because she she was worried about what they would think. She was more like annoyed but then everybody in the free world would be like, well, what's my voice color? Like, what's this? What's this? And it gets tiresome. So, um, so she doesn't really, again, for her, it's, it's nothing. It's just, it's just something that she has. Uh, so the last term before this video, uh, ends is a term called agnosia and you don't want to have agnosia. So agnosia is not a specific condition. Agnosia is a generic term for when your brain, for whatever reason, due to genetics, or more likely due to some kind of brain condition, um, agnosia, agnosia can be temporary or permanent, but agnosias can be due to things such as concussions, strokes, seizures, tumors, uh, things of that nature. But agnosia is a generic term that means you have some kind of perceptual problem. Like there is something broken in your brain. Like there is some kind of software perception in your brain that does not work correctly. And you perceive everything normally that is around you except for whatever type of agnosia you have. So agnosia, again, that's a generic word. But there are very, very specific types of agnosia. Now there's dozens. There are dozens of types of agnosia where basically everything is fine except for this one issue. So with agnosia, it's basically there is a structure or a region of the brain that normally is responsible for handling a certain thing about the environment, but in this person, possibly due to genetics, more likely due to things such as brain trauma, such as seizures or strokes or whatever, they temporarily or permanently have some kind of perceptual damage that prevents them from being able to do something normally. So here are some examples, and you don't, I don't know that you would need to know any of them, but there are dozens of types of agnosia. So one example of agnosia is what is called prosopagnosia. So people that have prosopagnosia suffer from a condition known as face blindness. Now, what that means is that they uh, everything around them they can see normally, except they can't identify other people's faces by looking at them. 
Um, now they can describe a face, like they could describe the features of a face because that is a separate part of the brain, but there's a different part of your brain that puts it together and says, oh yeah, that's a picture of this famous celebrity or, oh yeah, that's a picture of my husband or wife or, oh yeah, that's a picture of, you know, whatever or whoever. Uh, but for people with prosopagnosia, they have the inability to identify people by their face. So um, people with prosopagnosia, um, they would not actually be able to identify their own friends and family or any famous celebrities if you showed them a photo. You could actually show them a photo of themselves, and they would not be able to tell you who that person is. Um, now, if they obviously people with uh, prosopagnosia, that is very debilitating. They have ways around this. For example, I once watched a documentary of a woman that had prosopagnosia, and she um, she talked about how, like, well, when I look in the mirror, I don't recognize that person. The only reason I know it's me is because, you know, obviously nobody else is here. She talked about how you know, when she drops her kids off at school, she, you know, when they get back into the car, she's looking for things such as the clothes they're wearing, or she obviously waits for them to talk to her. Uh, or she looks for other things such as their backpack, uh, because otherwise she cannot, she doesn't recognize her own kids by looking at their faces. So if for whatever reason, if her kids, you know, at school completely changed their clothes and got back into her car at the end of the day, uh, to be picked up and didn't say a word, she has no idea if she's picked up her kids or two random strangers because she cannot identify them. So they have to use things such as uh, tattoos and jewelry and clothing and their voice to help identify people because they can't do it by faces. Now think about how debilitating this must be because looking people and identifying people by faces is about the most programmed thing in our brain that is possible. Another good example are people that have uh, what is called time agnosia. There are people that have, and this is usually due to strokes, um, people with time agnosia, they know how time works, like in the sense of like they know how many seconds are in a minute, how many minutes are in an hour, and they obviously know that time exists. But people with time agnosia, they they cannot accurately track how much time has actually taken place. So people with time agnosia, you could ask them the last time they had cereal for breakfast, and they might not be able to tell you whether it was this morning or 10 years ago uh you could ask them like like let's say they got in let's say they got into a car accident uh, last week and you ask them you know when was your car accident they might not be able to tell you whether it was 15 minutes ago or 20 years ago uh, so people with time agnosia they cannot correctly track time uh, if you ask them to do a task and then tell them how long that task took they might tell you anywhere from it took 30 seconds to two years or something like that because they cannot track time. It's a very unusual phenomenon. But everything else about them is okay. Uh, another one that, um, and this is an extremely interesting one in my opinion, is what is called akinetopsia. Akinetopsia is commonly referred to as motion blindness. Uh, people that have akinetopsia, they actually can't see anything when it's moving. So if, if like the, there is a different like there are two different parts of your brain that do things when they're stationary and things when they're moving regardless of what the thing is. So if you are standing still, they can see you. If you then move, you disappear. Now the interesting thing is they can still tell you where you are. They can still point to you because knowing the location of an object and seeing it as it's moving are two different parts of the brain. And I don't even mean that they're relying on sound, although they certainly can rely on the sound of things like your footsteps. But even if you were completely silent and you're like stalking around the room and they can't actually visually see you, they can still point you out and know where you are. Like if you threw a tennis ball at them, um, it is quite probable that they would be able to catch the tennis ball, even though they wouldn't actually be able to see it because knowing where it is in your environment is different from being able to physically see it. But people with motion blindness, if they were to, for example, like, like if you waved at them, they would see everything but your arm. Or if they were looking in the mirror 
and like if they started to move, they would become <laughs> vampires essentially because they would not be able to see themselves in their own reflection. As you can imagine, people with uh, kinetopsia cannot have a driver's license until the condition uh, uh, is gone, which uh, assuming it ever leaves them. And then also, um, like I, I, I once read an article of somebody with a kinetopsia that says one of the most annoying things about it is they can't even pour themselves their own cup of coffee because as they are pouring, they can't see the coffee being poured into the cup and they can't see the coffee as it's rising in their cup. So they have no idea when to stop. So they could be pouring coffee until it starts spilling all over the floor uh, because they can't see anything in motion. So kinetopsia, very unusual, very fascinating. Thankfully, it's usually a temporary condition. And by the way, I would point out that if anyone, like, if any, if you happen to be around somebody, and all of a sudden they started showing some type of agnosia of any kind, you definitely need to get them to the hospital immediately, because the agnosia is a symptom. It's not the problem, it's a symptom of a other problem. So someone who suddenly starts showing agnosia, that's the same reason, like, if you knew anyone that, you know, suddenly had left arm numbness or left arm paralysis, or suddenly they can't, you know, their speech center is messed up and they can't talk correctly, or they start spouting gibberish, you need to get them to the hospital immediately because that is a symptom of another problem, possibly a stroke or some other issue. So you definitely need to, like, anyone that starts showing any type of agnosia, you need to get them to the hospital immediately. Um... Uh, there's also people that have what's called phonognosia. That's voice blindness. It's basically like face blindness. People with phonognosia, if you play a recording, they know like what is being said. They can comprehend what is being said because comprehension of language is in a different area. So if you show, if you if you had them listen to an audio file, they could easily tell you, well, here's what the person said in their own words, and they could summarize the person's statement. But if you, but the problem is they can't tell you who said it. They can't identify the voice. So you could actually play them a recording of their own voice. They could tell you what the person said, but they could not tell you that it was their voice. So they can't identify voices. So there's, and like I said, there's dozens of them, and you can look online if you want to. Uh, but agnosia is a fascinating example of a perceptual problem. It also helps to show something that we've addressed multiple times already in this class. Your brain is extremely specialized by regions. So if you have a stroke, and it affects a tiny little region of your brain, it might affect one little issue in an otherwise normal brain. You know, that person is fine in every conceivable way, but they can't identify who's talking to them. They can, you know, they can do anything else, but they can't identify who's talking to them. Or they can do anything, but they can't correctly identify the passage of time or something like that. So it really shows you how specialized regions of the brain are and how micro strokes or micro seizures can damage one little neighborhood and everything else is fine but you know that one house has definitely been compromised in the neighborhood because of whatever so that's it for this video if you have any questions or concerns as always uh please let me know again if you have any stories to share about any of this stuff or any questions or concerns and again as always please check out some of the videos in the description below. I don't think it would definitely be a waste of your time to check out some of these things as some of these subjects are pretty fascinating uh, when it comes to psychology. But that's it for this video and I will see you next time.